Welcome to episode 127 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Perry Teo, who just wrote and directed a film called The Curse of Sleeping Beauty, which is a kind of modern retelling of the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale. We talk through some of the challenges to getting this movie made, and he offers some great tips for people who are trying to sell their story. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking us on Facebook. These social media shares me, these social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 127. I'm continually building out the SYS script library. It's all free. All the scripts are in PDF format. You can find that at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. I want to thank Nebe Mesud, who just sent me the Darjeeling Limited, the Grand Budapest Hotel, the Royal Tenenbaums, American Sniper, Boyhood, Captain Phillips, Gravity, Me and Earl and the Dying Girl, Room, Silver Linings Playlook, Playbook, True Grit, Trumbo, Unbroken, Moneyball, Spotlight, and The Wolf of Wall Street, Street Script. Thank you, Nabi, for sending in those scripts. Those are all posted to the SYS Script Library, so if you're looking for any of those scripts, by all means, check it out. I also want to thank Edward Gorey. He sent in Asylum, Avatar, The Hateful Eight, Edge of Tomorrow, and Run All Night. Again, thank you, Edward, for sending in those screenplays. I really do appreciate it. The, the SYS Script Library is totally, you know, just been built by people sending me scripts just like this. So if you have a script, just do me one favor. Check, just go to the SYS Script Library, selling your screenplay.com, so that's library. Just see if it's already in the library. If it's not, if it's a screenplay that's been produced and it's not in the library, please do just email me. Um, a PDF of the, of the script is preferred, but I think you can probably take about any format and I can convert it to PDF. But just email me those if you have them, info at sellingyourscreenplay.com. It is very much appreciated. And um, I would say at this point, we have well over a thousand scripts that you can go and download. Again, all of them are in PDF format, so it's easy to download. And it's easy to read them on whatever device you use. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. I just want to mention a free webinar that I'm doing on Wednesday, June 8th at 10 a.m. It's called How to Effectively Market Your Screenplay and Sell It. I'm going to go through all the various online channels that are available to screenwriters and give you my unfiltered opinion of them. I get questions all the time about the blacklist, about ink tip, about which contests people um, think they should enter. And I'm going to go through all of these different channels. I've personally tried all of these channels and had some success with some of them, less success with others. So I'm just going to share my experience with them, kind of talk about what I think that they're good for on this um, webinar. Again, this webinar is completely free. If you can't make it to the live event, don't worry. I will be recording the event. And then if you sign up and don't can't, can't if you sign up I'm going to basically email the link after the webinar takes place I'm going to record it and then I will send a link to everybody who has signed up so again even if you can't make that live date at 10 a.m. Pacific time on June 8th don't worry about it still sign up and then I will email you after the webinar with a link to the recording if you want to get in on this just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash free webinar again that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash free webinar and it's all one word just free webinar lowercase and all one word also if you're already on my email list meaning you already get emails from me you don't need to sign up for this again I will email everybody who's on my email list I will send them a link to the webinar on how to um, to get an access to it again it's free so anybody who's already on my list I will be sending out that link to you if you're not already on my email list do sign up again selling your screenplay.com slash free webinar so just a quick few words about what I'm working on. Um, once again, I'm still plowing ahead on pre-production for my crime action thriller script, The Pinch. Um, I've got a little more than a month now before I start shooting. The shoot date is going to be um, Saturday, July 9th. That's going to be the first shooting date. Um, and we're going to shoot for three weeks, taking off on Mondays and Tuesdays. So it'll basically be Wednesday through Sunday, although the first two days will be a Saturday and a Sunday. 
go for three weeks, 15 day shoot. I've started to cast the project. I have several roles cast now. Um, I've got three of my four locations locked in, so that's coming along nicely. I've pretty much got my crew together. There's still a few positions I do need to fill. Um, and I would say even now, maybe some backup positions. You know, I've got some people that um, can do certain positions, but not every single day of the shoot. So I've got to find some people to fill in on those specific days. But um, the crew's basically coming together and then um, the, the acting the casting is coming together as well. So I'm going to really hopefully now be able to start to focus on some of the creative decisions. There's still quite a bit of paperwork. You know, you got to get the deal memos from, from all the crew. You got to get the um, actors to sign their contracts. So there's still some paperwork that needs to be, needs to be done, but um, I think I'm in pretty good shape. And as I said, I'm going to try and start um, really focusing on some of the creative issues, preparing a shot list, um, production design, going over the locations with my production designer and just start and really get get some of these creative things worked out and figured out hopefully make this the best movie possible so I think everything's moving along nicely as I said I'm got over a month and um, things are in pretty good shape so hopefully that'll all be ready to go by July 9th I'm a little bit nervous about it um, there's just a lot of moving parts um, the other big thing I got um, it's not signed sealed and delivered so it's but we have a, a verbal agreement I did get all my insurance worked out and I'll kind of be announcing that more formally maybe by next week um, but I'm basically got the insurance and and um, I'm renting some some lighting and grip equipment and using some locations from a particular production house here in LA so that's going to be a great relationship um, I think going forward Forward, um, they're able to bring a lot of resources to the production so I'll be talking more about that as as time goes on I'm also planning on wrapping all of this stuff up into a course that I will be offering probably next like January February once the movie is completely done and I've started to get it out um, to film festivals to distributors and kind of feel like there's um, you know uh, the thing is, is basically done um, so it might even be maybe a year from now but I am going to do a, um, a wrap up I'm going to run some kind of an online course about everything I did um, and really go into the nitty gritty so um, you know if you're interested in kind of learning the real nitty gritty on this stay tuned because I will be um, wrapping up all of this into some sort of an online course and um, running that probably next year so anyways that's kind of what I'm working on let's move into the main segment today I'm interviewing screenwriter and director Perry Tejo today's interview is gonna be a little different than normal um, you know I'm trying to get the audio quality to raise the audio quality on these interviews and there were definitely some issues so I had to cut some chunks of this interview out um, so it's not going to be quite as linear as the interviews normally are normally they're very conversational where we kind of just talk and go through questions um, there may be some cuts in here where I just remove whole sections of this obviously I'm going to edit it together it's all edited together so it makes sense but um, it's not quite the linear conversation that maybe um, we're used to doing here at selling your screenplay anyway here is the interview Welcome, Perry, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, thank you very much, Ashley, and thanks for having me on the show. So to start out, maybe you can give us a little bit about your background, kind of how you broke into the entertainment industry, and um, even take us back, you know, before that. Maybe, you know, what was your childhood like? I mean, were you always interested in film? Were you one of these kids that was running around with a video camera? And um, just take us up through that and then maybe through your first professional credit. I, <clears throat> I actually started making films because um, if, if I was going to be really honest with you, I was a F1 student and I just need the credits to get in <laughs> uh, to get my, you know, to keep my F1 student visa. So I took up a video course uh, just to keep my 15 credit score. And ever since I held, you know, a video camera, I just fell in love with it. Huh, okay. And then so let's talk about maybe your first kind of professional credit. Um, you've got this interest now in filmmaking. How did you go from, you know, that one class to actually having some professional credits? Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming professional, you know, meaning that, you know, you're, you're going to get paid for your first job. Um, really, I think uh, the steps is, is to, you know, really, really pay your dues. Uh, I've worked with producers um, many times. Times, uh, and I'm doing, uh, I'm writing for them, practically almost free. Um, you know, even to this day, sometimes you know, if they need something and have it, I'll be like, here, take. Um, essentially, being a professional is really more about building a relationship uh, with producers, directors, and all that. When if you really, really want to sell your screenplay, uh, screenplays today are so, so tough to sell. 
um, you know, trying to trying to say that you're a professional. You, you can only really count a handful of professional screenwriters that, you know, get paid the old Hollywood style, uh, taking a story, getting paid. Uh, you know, nowadays, just, you know, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling just to walk into a studio and just see the stack of un, un, unread screenplays. It, it, it would just blow your mind. Um, does, does that mean, I mean, I mean, can you imagine how many good stories are there just waiting to be discovered? But there's just so many. There's just no time to read it. So uh, the ones that get read are the ones that have forged relationships with, you know, the actual um, uh, indie studios or, you know, major studios it's it, it depends yeah like a lot of people who are going to come to to our blog to my blog and listen to this podcast you know they're going to be looking to do exactly what you just said network so do you have some tips for them like how can they network and how can they meet these producers even to get what you're saying just those really you know almost free writing jobs just to find those producers and start to make those connections you really don't want to go to the producers and all those network meetings i i have not met a single producer who has paid me for my work that has ever been to these network meetings. Um, you know, they, 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 I have known them to meet screenwriters at, it, it's really funny, in, in, in places you, you, you might not even think about meeting. Um, you know, I, I, I know a producer of mine who met uh, a screenwriter for his last film that he just did, um, you know, that was a $50 million film, and he met him at a, a charity ball, uh, a dinner. And and you know there, there are various places that that you can meet a lot of producers and all that. But I I, I suggest my my number one thing is do not fall into that whole uh, network parties kind of thing. You know into that problems. Do not approach producers at parties. Uh, those almost can absolutely never work. Um, if you know. We, 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 when we're all partying, the last thing we want is um, to be shoved a, a, a you know, a card. Uh, we don't. We 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 we, we, we want to have fun, and the last thing we are thinking about is, um, you know, trying to arrange for a new script to be read. In 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 fact, when you when I say, "Would you want to read my script?" All of a sudden, my mind thinks of work, and I have like fifty scripts I haven't read yet, and I'm like, ah. Oh! <laughs> you know, that's uh, that, that, that can be a, quite a ball breaker there. So let's dig into the curse of Sleeping Beauty. Maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick pitch, kind of just tell us maybe a log line or just give us a pitch for the film. Uh, Sleeping Beauty is a, it's a modern day um, film um, surrounding the fact that, you know, 10,000 years later, what if Sleeping Beauty never woke up? Uh, what if the prince never came? You know, what, what happened to her, you know? And so we, we, we decided to surround our world with, uh, you know, demons and monsters that have, you know, kind of guarded her, her body, kept her alive, uh, you know, keeping the fairy tale alive, essentially. And, and how does this work into our present day fairy tale mythos? Yeah, yeah. And where did this idea come from? Uh, well, me and Everett Hartso, uh, he's a comic book illustrator. Uh, we, we, we really just sat down and, you know, it's funny, a lot of my horror films come from jokes. We, we, we started, we started um, sitting around, joking around, and go, ha, wouldn't it be cool? You know what? What if that Prince never came? Tee hee 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 hee. And all of a sudden, we got a horror film from that. <laughs> you know? so, mm -hmm. so it's funny. It's uh -huh. like, I, I know a lot of people are like, you know, uh, ideas should come from here, here. It, it comes from everywhere. You just have to really keep your eyes open and, you know, keep your ideas linked up together because you never know where it comes from. Um, you know, my craziest, um, you know, horror film ideas can come from the most random places in the world. Um, so, so it really depends. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's walk through just your writing process a little bit. Um, you were a co-writer um, of this project, and and I've written scripts with other people. So I'm always curious to kind of hear how, what your actual writing process looks like. Do you guys get in the same room with each other? What tools, collaboration tools, do you use to write together? Just how does that process go? Um, <clears throat> usually, the first case is um, you know we sit down, we come out the story together, overall story. And, um, and, and and what we do is we try to come out not I want to say a half half treatment almost uh, we, we, we don't want to get into too many details kind of things and and the, the, the first thing that we that, that I would try to do is usually for me I would write the complete first draft first and once I finish with the first draft you know we look at it and we see how bad it is 
<laughs> and then once we see how bad it is, if, if it's a big, you know, rewrite, then we're probably going to go with a script, man, where we just do headers and, um, you know, paragraph description of the scenes and things like that. Uh, but it's, you know, usually by the time we start writing, I already have the, I already had the interest of uh, the producer Ehud Bleiber, who owns Bleiber Entertainment. So once we knew what the story was about. Um, it was a very simple matter of writing it and then sending it over to you know uh, the my second screenwriter, and we, we we always know what our faults are already. So there are things that he doesn't touch, like visual stuff uh, that's written in the script. He usually never touches that. Like Josh Nadler, he's very very good at that. <clears throat> but when it comes to you know dialogue and things like that, he 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 is much much stronger than me in dialogue, and so usually I like to trust him on that one a little bit more. So it you know it it really depends. <clears throat> For me, my process is definitely let each of us have our creative splurge first, and then once we have that, we can both sit and go, okay, what are your strengths? What are my strengths? And let's try based on this structured first draft. How do we contribute each of us into this? And and that's how I see it. Yeah. So so the way and and I'm just kind of trying to summarize what you said and make sure I understand it. So basically, this first sort of half treatment you're talking about, it's you and another writer, and you guys are in the same room. And then once you kind of have that done, um, you flush it out a little bit further and then hand it off to another writer. Right. Kind of polish. By up. same room, I'm assuming you're meaning. Uh, same headspace because uh, we've never even met. <laughs> oh, okay, really? really? It's yeah. On, it's via Skype or telephone yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, that's interesting to know. And then how long does this process take when you guys are writing this screenplay? Just from like, you know, the very start and how much time do you spend on this half treatment? You know, usually when it comes to a producer interested in a script, when if a producer's not interested in a script, uh, and we're just doing it on spec. Uh, me and another writer have spent about six months to a year on it. But usually when a producer is interested, when he has a plan on how to sell it, where to sell it, and all that already, um, we sometimes have anywhere from three weeks to two months to finish it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can get it down if you have to in that in that spot. You have yeah. to. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, it sounds like with this particular project, you had a producer involved very very early on. So did you pitch it to him as sort of just a loose idea, and then he said, "Yeah, I'll I'll mm -hmm. I'll, I'll get behind that project." Usually, the thing about pitching that I find a lot of screenwriters make a big mistake on is um, is that when they pitch a screenplay, they try to pitch the story and how wonderful it is. You should never ever pitch it that way. The fastest way to pitch it to a producer is to, is to pitch to him how he sells it. So don't worry about your story yet. Worry about how he's going to sell it. So by showing him a mock-up poster, by showing him the one sheets and all that, you know, he looks at it and go, wow, this, I could sell this movie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, and I can write it too. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, that, that that's really how you, you got to make him see it. You, when, when he sees it, he's got to visualize himself at, you know, Marche du Kant's AFM and all this place is selling it. He's got to visualize that. If he cannot visualize that, he's not going to want to do your script idea. Yeah. Okay. And I see. And you are an artist yourself, so you can create these posters and the one sheets? Absolutely. Um, I'm not, say, the best artist in the uh -huh. world, but I would say even if you go... I mean, I got my education in Photoshop on Udemy uh -huh. for 20 yeah, bucks, yeah. you know? <laughs> and it's really not that hard, um, you know, to learn Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And right now, Photoshop is so cheap. You can get it for $50 a month. It's such a good investment. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it is very, very important because a lot of screenwriters, they know how to write scripts and I've, re I've read so many good scripts, you know, uh, you know, sometimes when I, my agent or manager brings me a new script and I, and, and I look at it and I say, like, well, how am I going to sell it? Unless I'm, I, I'm able to put in a huge star into it, it's impossible. Yeah. And so I, I think a lot of screenwriters understand the, pr the process very well, but then but but you have to be able to understand the end product, the end process. If you don't understand the end process, your your, your product's useless. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to create, you know, a a a, a spork, you gotta know how to sell yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> you 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 gotta know how 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 it's gonna be packaged. You gotta know why people are gonna buy it. 
you know, inventors at least have that ability to see, like, okay, I want to in- invent this product, but they also can see how they're going to package it, how they're going to sell it, in what stores they're going to sell it. Now, one thing, uh, well, a, a lot of conversations I have with producers, they're always looking for, you know, some way of like tapping into literary material that already exists. And this story kind of does this, you know, it's kind of a, a modern day retelling of Sleeping Beauty. How much did that sort of um, go into your thought process in terms of when you came up with this idea, did you, did you purposely want to attach yourself to a classic, you know, story like Sleeping Beauty that you knew? a producer would be interested in just how much sort of did that affect your thought process with this and and ultimately how much do you think it affected the producer who you pitched it to uh it was everything to be honest with you it was um when producers when when, when producers are buying into to script ideas and all that um they're really buying into intellectual property uh they're they're buying into the fact how, how many people would instantly recognize um you know they're still cheap and things like that that's how people buy it so so yeah it, it has got a lot to do with it you know my like my producer says everybody knows sleeping beauty like you know that that would be an easy sell for him you know everybody knows iron man spider-man superman uh, batman and all that that's why they're gonna you know they're greenlit so easily but you know have half another um idea that's a completely original idea is going to be tough unless your, your producer goes oh oh my goodness i can sell this concept this would be great <laughs> you know and, and that's why I, I think a lot of screenwriters try to fall into that habit of you know pitching movies like movie a meets movie b or it's a bit like movie a but a comedy version of it you know they, they, they try to use other films but Here's the problem with that. That isn't a part of your sales. That's not going to be in the back of your DVD. That's not going to be on the description of Netflix. Um, so, so what is it? When you have your app product, you always have to think, why are people going to buy it? So screenwriters really need to start looking and start understanding that there's a process of film and distribution a little bit more because it's going to help them tremendously, you know, not knowing what kind of a film supposed to sell, what's eye-catching, you know, what the, do, do not try to go for trends. Trends don't work anymore. Um, by the time you write your script based on a trend, the trend's going to be gone. So instead, focus on how you can make a film really sell. And if there's one thing that any screenwriter has always asked me, I, I always say, please, please, go, go look at, you know, the, the, the distribution side of it. Please look at, um, you know, when, when you're in Netflix, don't just go looking for a movie. Uh, go look at what's the hottest movie. Why are they the hottest? Uh, do, do, do certain concepts uh, remain popular, you know, constantly with people? Um, you know, and, and, and what, are, what are those? And, and then those are just concepts. Those are just uh, things, you know. You can tell your, you, you can tell your story. Uh, you can tell a story of, you know, a, a, a uh, let's say, a, about an orphan, a, a misunderstood orphan. You can tell it as a science fiction. You can tell it as a horror. You can tell it as a comedy. You can tell it as a drama. Um, and so stories are great in a sense, but now you have to decide what your ego, and based on your context, can your ego sell it? I have a producer who can sell horror and sci-fi, uh, and I have another producer who can sell fantasy, but couldn't sell horror and sci-fi to save her life. So it, it really depends on, on, on you know the people around you and understanding your resources and understanding how to sell it would, would, would be really you know the part of the winning formula of what makes you a professional and successful screenwriter. That the world doesn't evolve around you you and your script and that's it (laughs) yeah so maybe you can just tell us the release schedule do you know um when it's coming out and um how people can see it we will be having a limited theatrical release on may the 13th uh 2016 and um you know after that from may 21st onwards we will be out on uh vod itunes um you know the usual suspect well perry i really appreciate you coming on and talking with me um this has been a fascinating interview i really enjoyed the film so i wish you luck with it Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you later.
Just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. I went and emailed my large database of five, 6,000 producers and asked them if they wanted to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have well over 300 producers who have signed up to receive this newsletter. These are producers who are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of these producers, sign up at sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And secondly, I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. These are, there are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, I've been getting probably 10 to 12 high quality paid leads per week for screenwriters. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their specific ideas or to write up some option piece of material they might have like a novel or a newspaper article, something like that. The, there are producers looking for shorts. There are producers looking for features. There are producers looking for TV and web series pilots. It's a huge array of different types of projects. So no matter what kind of stuff you're working on, I'm sure every month you'll be able to find some leads that apply to you. And these leads are obviously exclusive to our partner and to SYS Select members. Again, to sign up, go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Selling Your Screenplay Select covers quite a bit of our services. The two things I just mentioned, the monthly newsletter um, pitch to producers, you get access to that. Obviously, you also get the leads that I just mentioned. The other big thing that you get through SYS Select is you get access to our forum, the SYS Select forum. And in there, you can post your logline and query letter and we will help you out. Um, we will critique it and we will help you make it better. The other big thing that's in the SYS Select forum, and again, this is all part of the SYS Select membership, is you also get access to about 12 online classes that I and others have taught over the last couple of years. All the paid classes that I've run, I have recorded and I put them in the SYS Select Forum. So if you join, you can have access to that. And there's a whole huge array of different topics that I've covered, all, all the different stages of writing your script. And then there's some specific things about writing low budget films, writing shorts, pitching, um, lots of different classes in there. As I said, I think there's about a dozen of them. And you can see what all the classes are just by going going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. And then you can look at all the classes we've run. And again, all of those paid classes are in the SYS Select forum if you're looking to um, check out any of those. So I just want to talk briefly about next week's episode. I'm going to be interviewing Sean Nalboff, who wrote and directed the new indie art house dramedy Hard Sell. It's a good contrast to the sort of usual genre films that I talk about, the horror, the action, the thriller genre um, films that are coming through selling a screenplay. This is really sort of very much an indie art house dramedy. So if you're interested in, in, in writing that type of material, this is a great interview for, um, for you to listen to. Um, Sean is just a guy that went out and um, you know wrote his script and um, got a little momentum, but he's a real hustler and um, ultimately him and and um, his partner raised the money for this movie and um, you know we talk about that in in some detail so keep an eye out for that episode next week so to wrap things up I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Perry one of the big takeaways from me one of the big takeaways for me um, with this interview is um, just the the retelling of a modern day classic story and really think about this. I know Hollywood gets a lot of sort of flack as being uncreative and, you know, all they do is produce, you know, remakes and sequels and, um, you know, but there's a reason for that. And it's the same sort of reason. It's not just because there are these people are uncreative. It's it's a financial reason. It's it's about marketing the films. It's about risk. It's about being able to create a movie that has, stands a reasonable chance of recouping the money. And this is sort of what the, what Perry's film is doing on sort of a different, um, just sort of a different angle. Um, 
as I said, I mean, there's a reason there are so many sequels, prequels made every year, pre sequels, prequels, and remakes made every year. It really is because the distributors have a known commodity, which makes the whole process a lot less risky, and it makes the film um, much easier to sell. At the studio level, this is going to involve optioning and adapting something like a hit novel, you know, a big Stephen King novel, some, you know, property that has already has sort of a built-in market. That's what the studios in a lot of cases will do. Um, they'll go after those those pieces of material because again it has a built-in in market um, but adapting something that's in the public domain that is well known is also a great way to potentially do this um, you know I don't have the resources to option um, you know big literary properties from from you know a list authors like Stephen King and most of the people listening to this podcast probably don't either but you know you're essentially when you go and, and adapt something that's in the public domain, you're essentially writing a sequel, prequel, or remake. Um, in, a, in a lot of cases, some of these old, um, you know, Edgar Allan Poe stories, they may have already made movies about these things, and that totally doesn't matter. Um, so you're doing a remake, perhaps, on that. But the great thing is about these things that are in the public domain is you don't have to pay licensing fees. They're, they're in the public domain, so anybody can use them. I talk about this. Um, I talked about this a good bit on the podcast last fall. Um, I got hired to write a spoof last October, and that's a similar type of thing where the producers were basically hoping to ride the coattails of a recent successful film without having to pay a licensing fee, without having to do a you know prequel, sequel, or remake of that successful film. You do a spoof, and then you can kind of play off that success a little bit. Um, so there's a lot of creative ways to do this but what you're really doing is, is you're giving the distributors a marketing hook you're giving them something that they can go out out to the market and already has some sort of public awareness if you just make them if you just make a movie and and I'm basically doing this with my crime action thriller the pinch I'm just going out and making a movie it's going to be a much more difficult sell um, whereas if you go out and do something like what Perry did with Sleeping Beauty people have heard of that story there's a little bit of sort of awareness out there and so someone might like that story they might remember that story from their childhood or something and that just is a little bit you're attaching yourself to that um, thing that's already famous and um, you're able to to use that hook as sort of a marketing angle and um, potentially get people to 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 watch this movie and distributors are where well aware of this and they need um, you know they need those marketing hooks to be able to sell a film so um, it's something that's that's definitely worth thinking about um, you know it's something in the back of my mind I I'm thinking about as well hey what what stories are out there that I could adapt you do want to do your due diligence and make sure that what you're adapting is in the public domain it's not always as simple or as easy as you might think so definitely check this out I'm not a lawyer I don't play one on TV so I don't want to don't email me hey is this in the public domain because I can't help you with that kind those kinds of legal things just as I was thinking about this podcast episode and what I was going to say I started to do a little research on like as an example HP Lovecraft stories you know he's got a lot of sort of thriller stories that could easily be adapted um, and I just googled searched him and he died in like 1937 um, and then I started to search well what actually is in the public domain and it's not that clear it's it's it was uh, just in my five minute search it was a little bit confusing to me um, you know there's different levels of copywriting people can extend copyright there's extensions and and there's filing copyright notices so um, you just have to be a little bit aware of that obviously if something is hundreds of years old Shakespeare for instance you know it's in the public domain there's not anybody that has any kind of licensing over um, stuff that's that's 400 years old but um, you know stuff that's like you know 75 or 80 years old there might be some issues 100 years old I would think 100 years old you're probably pretty safe but again I'm not a lawyer so definitely do your due diligence because the whole point of doing something like this is to get those marketing hooks and um, you know you might just shoot yourself in the foot if you end up writing a, a adapting something that you don't have the rights to and it's not in the public domain then um, you know you've gone the other direction and you've made something very very difficult it becomes very very difficult to sell that because then you've got to make sure that you've secured those rights or at the very least you know the producer is going to have to secure those rights and that may may or may not be an easy thing to do so bottom line unless the story is really really old definitely um, probably talk do some research and maybe talk to a lawyer because um, it's just not always as clear what's in the public domain um, 
as as what, what's in the public domain and is not. Um, again, I just want to mention this. I mentioned this a second ago. In a lot of cases, these these stories have been made. Edgar Allan Poe is a great example. A lot of his um, stories have been turned into movies over the years. Um, but I don't think that matters. I think that there's still um, room in the marketplace for an original and a unique twist on some of these classic stories. Um, you know, you could you you you'll do your own spin. You'll be your own unique voice to some of these things. And I think if you could get a script that has some sort of public awareness, um, is in the public domain, but has some public awareness, I think that would be a great script to have and um, something producers would be interested in. And if you're looking to produce something yourself, I think it would be something that um, potentially you'd have a good chance of selling as well. Um, and then, as I said, this the reason I'm talking about this is because look at what Perry has done with, with his film um, and look at kind of how he, he answered that question when I, when I asked it um, of him. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.